The Flint City Charter's mandates that if a vacancy occurs on the Flint City Council with less than a year, then that vacancy shall be filled by the Flint City Council. You have a responsibility. You took an oath of office that you would abide by the Charter, the Constitution of the State of Michigan, and the Constitution of the United States of America. That's your responsibility, and that is your duty. While the council represents nine wards, it's yet a whole. And if you have 10, and you leave off one, then you don't have a whole. You have an incomplete body. I think it's wrong. Martin Luther King said this also. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And it seemed like everything he said is coming to flourishing. Right here in the city of Flint. Or you can say, well, the financial manager, he sent a, a resolution or whatever order that, we, that he would not appoint. He didn't say that you couldn't appoint, but he would not appoint. That's what he said. So maybe the onus is on you. I know this individuals, I, you read in the paper that uh, Sargerson, uh, former Sargerson, he made a re recommendation. I understand that there was letters sent, uh, there were individuals that wanted to be on uh, to fill that seat for the next two months or so. I think that this council, this Flint City Council, it's nothing but two, four, six of you, you need five for it. Someone should make a resolution. And I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna quote Scott Kincaid, quote, that when a council person leaves his or her seat, whoever they recommend, that's who we, that's who I appoint, that's who I vote for. I think that happened with uh, Ms. Clune. I think that's what happened. If Reverend Flynn was recommended by Sargison, then what would be the difference? What would be the difference? Is it a new rule? You know, as I say, these rule changes. Hopefully, when we get a new council, a lot of this rule changing won't be changing, but we'll be studying for the course. Thank you. I think that as I close that a motion should be put forth by the city council to appoint somebody to represent the 8th Ward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dumas. Yeah. <clears throat> Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is oh, our... I'm sorry, Claudia. Okay. I'm sorry. You, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really pathetic. Some of, the, some of the things that have been said here tonight. Eight months, nine months, ten months is a heck of a lot different than six weeks. And you're so quick to remind us that you have no power. You have no power. But then you think we can overrule the emergency manager in appointing a city council person. You all need to be real. If they cut the cameras off, I wonder if you would have all that uh, conversation. There's no comparison and me being appointed December 20th, 2012, and Sargentson leaving August 5th, 2013, with just a few weeks left in his term. Talk to Sargentson, he abandoned me. We did. Oh, that's it. Thank you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. R.L. Mitchell. Good evening, R.L. Yes, yeah, Scott, good evening. I'm R.L. Mitchell. And uh, 
talk about this blight stuff. I've been blighted all my life, ever since I've come to Flint from Georgia and went in the elementary school over in Fairview on Lee Street, and from Lee Street to Crack School, you're talking about, and there was another Duke there named Christopher Brown. Brown become a Duke. He called himself making this, turning the city of Flint into black everywhere he go. And like, uh, in 1963, I remember it was a, no disrespect to a uh, city clerk, Madam Brown, it was another madam, I remember when I was in Clark School, sixth grade, took, call us up, Madam O'Hara, took prayer out of, prayer out of school, to, I mean, pledge the legion, they call that a prayer. And there somebody, I went from Clark School to Whittier, and from Whittier they closed, from the eighth grade, it had been deserted ever since they blighted that out. I went over to McKinley, then I blighted McKinley out, then went from McKinley to Southwestern. They are blight everywhere I go. I see a big old sign talking about saying the city of Flint, that this big rock over there, already blight. And Dumas talking about Miss Coon, Miss Coon, Miss Coon, she gonna be the one in the dress, dress Madame O'Hara to put the prayer back in the school if you keep on pushing it, Dumas. You think, think it's a joke? I'm gonna push it in. Okay, all right, all right, now. And what I'm gonna say, that was on, this Saturday I was uh, invited to, to be in the White House. But it's last, but the, it's the last month, the woman then, she, she said, she said, Mitchell, I don't think you should go. She said, come on, talk to you. And when I found out, well, these women, these people was born in 1970, another generation, 43 years old, ain't never been married, ain't got no kids, and telling a man, you don't think, I don't think, cause something might happen to me, and she was still responsible for, me, cause she invited me to Washington D.C. I ain't even, I forgot about it. it. Was the uh, anniversary of the first march of the greatest speech on in history of the United States? Thought every man is created equal. We hold these truths to be self-evident, and in front of the Lincoln Memorial stuff, and uh, and this dude talking about this black theater, talking about racial stuff, talking about. This racial, this city and stuff talking about Flint. I think scared to talk about some racial jump on that Buckingham Alley down there and talk about. I believe a dude told that whole restaurant down for I won't sue the place. They wanted me to sue the place, but they said Christians aren't supposed to sue, sue nobody. You're supposed to be like Jesus Christ and get slapped and get spit on and no one must say nothing about it. Them millionaires be gambling in the basement down there. Them dupes, the real dupes of Flint, stupid junk and heathens. They ain't where I go with stupid junk, scared to talk about these insane pastors and up and all the way, all the way got to back down, act like somebody's a pushover, and up Jim Jones, purple Kool Aid junk and heathens. That's what I call them and stuff and always making making me look like a naive, cause nobody don't say nothing, cause somebody sitting on out right there on the grass, over there talking about get off my grass and let it. A day you come back up and want me to jack slap one of them sheds out there, you stupid junk and heathen. He, you stupid junk! And once you come, scared to call the federal in the book and get them to weep, them the national guys going, talking about cease fighting all them little stupid words, you stupid junk and you stupid junk! Hey, what you want? I got a whole lot of time. I'll let somebody else have my time. Thank you, R.L. <laughs> Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is uh, Bill Roberts. Bill Roberts. Good evening, Bill. My name is Bill Roberts. I work with the LaRouche Policy Institute. And I wanted to talk to you here today about this pension swipe that's going on in the city of Detroit and the austerity, because it's coming to other places, obviously. And um, it's a Gettysburg moment for the nation as far as how this is, how this is handled. And just, I um, contributed to a report um, on this, on what this means, which if any of you don't have it, I'll be glad to share it with you. But here, here's, what the, here's what the issue is. Um, 
Bill, just not to interrupt, I believe I've given a copy or a copy was provided to most council members of that okay. report. Okay, okay. I think so. Yeah. I think so, okay. Thank you. Here, here's what, just to, a general overview. Um, you know, the city of Detroit, and I think 75% of cities um, entered into interest rate swaps. Um, these, in, in the case of Detroit, um, many other places, hundreds of millions of dollars were swindled by, uh, through these interest rate swaps. And um, in fact, about 30, an estimated $30 billion have been robbed from cities, public utilities, states. Um, and there are a number of lawsuits in the case of Detroit, what's happening through this Chapter 9 filing by the emergency financial manager is they want to take the pensions away from people and then fully, almost fully pay the value of financial derivatives, which were basically insurance on bonds, which were actually being rigged by, I'd say, the 12 or 14 largest banks on the planet. The, the rates were rigged against the cities so that the banks were basically paying 4% under what Detroit was paying. And this, is, this has happened in a number of places. But the point is that if you look at this thing as a national um, from a national perspective. The fact of the matter is Wall Street is bankrupt. Wall Street is saturated in toxic gambling debts several times, 10 times, 20 times beyond the, the, um, the GDP of, of the entire world. I, I mean, the, the amount of uh, financial derivatives um, gambling debts that are in Wall Street, um, uh, it, it just makes it clear that these things can never be paid. So there's legislation now in the, in, in the U.S. House of Representatives, in the Senate, to restore Glass-Steagall, which would force a separation between commercial banking and investment banking. There's 74 co-sponsors on the bill in the House of Representatives, there's 10 in the Senate. That's the Warren McCain bill. This would bankrupt Wall Street. And uh, with the bankruptcy of Wall Street, you could have national credit of the type that FDR organized for the development of the nation again. Detroit, Flint, these areas with the skilled labor force, with the with the plant capacity that's unused, could actually be the basis for a new economy for the United States, including a lot of nuclear power, water development projects, and these types of things. So um, instead, of, instead of seeing Detroit as a unique case, which I'm sure you probably don't, obviously, but that's the narrative in the news media. Detroit's unique mismanagement and this type of thing. The point is that right now, 